Sephardic culture, which came of age in the orbit of Islam, Sephardic culture, which was rooted in the Muslim Iberian kingdom of Al-Andalus, was transformed as the Christians, through the Reconquista, the Reconquest, began to take over large sections of the peninsula. By the 13th century, the Christians had decisively defeated the Muslims, and the Christians now ruled in the four kingdoms of Portugal, Castile, Navarre, and Aragon. And the Jews, the Sephardic Jews, who made the trek up north from the Muslim south, they too became well integrated into these new Christian kingdoms. They began to develop relationships with the Christian overlords as they had with the Muslims. And their culture, which yes, they took with them as they went from the lands of the Muslims to the lands of the Christians, underwent a transformation. They studied the Bible and the Talmud, but the interpretations of the Bible and the Talmud, which they began to compose under Christian rule, differed in measure from that which existed before. So Sephardic Jews now were well ensconced in the four Iberian Christian kingdoms in the 13th century, socially and economically successful and culturally vital. It's at this point that we need to pause for a moment because all of us who are listening to this vodcast know something about Sephardic Jewish history which they are going to keep in their minds as we speak about Jews and Sephardic Jews in Christian lands. All of us know that in 1492, the Sephardic Jews were expelled from the Christian kingdoms of Castile and Aragon. And now as we begin to discuss the 14th century, we can't but help to think about the end of the story. But it's precisely that that we need to caution ourselves against. We have to study the history of the Jews in these Christian kingdoms, trying to keep from our mind that which is so obvious that at the end of the 15th century, the Jews are officially going to be banished from these lands. History cannot be predicted. Each moment involves an extraordinary range of choices. And if we would look at the 14th century, and we would look at our Sephardic Jews, we'd, we'd see in many respects that they are living a good life. As I said, economically integrated, especially within the cities of Castile and Aragon and also of Portugal and Navarre, uh, culturally connected to the Christians which surrounded them, having made great links with the political leadership of these kingdoms, Sephardic Jews had reasons to feel that they were secure and content. But as we've seen, living under Christianity was different than living under Islam. The ideas that began to percolate within medieval Western Christendom in the 13th century made their ways over the Pyrenees and deeply affected the lives of so many of these Sephardic Jews. If we would take a look at the 14th century generally, take a survey of Jewish life in the Christian kingdoms, I think the first place where we might would want to stop would be in the city of Toledo. We remember Toledo has been Christian now since the 11th century, and by the mid 14th century boasted an exceptionally large and significant Jewish community. Those of you who travel to Spain and visit the city of Toledo, you're able to walk into a building one of the most magnificent synagogues that exist on the European continent that precisely was built during the 1350s. The person who gave the money, who donated his funds for the erection of this magnificent synagogue was none other than Shmuel Halevi Abu Lafia. Shmuel Abu Lafia was the tesorero mayor. He was the chief treasurer to King Pedro I of Castile. He was in the long line of great Sephardi courtiers who served the king well and yet at the same time made sure to look out 
for his Jewish community. In the city of Toledo, Shmuel Halevi Abu Lafia builds a magnificent synagogue, and if you enter the synagogue, you'll notice that on the western wall where the Torahs are kept, there is an inscription dedicated precisely in honor of King Pedro I. The records that we do have seem to suggest that the Muslim population helped in the actual construction of the edifice. We could look at this synagogue, the synagogue known today as El Transito, as a perfect example of what we would like to call convivencia, of Jews, Christians, and Muslims living so well together. In this particular case, a synagogue built with Jewish funds in recognition of Christian political power and with the aid of Muslim workers. While it would seem that this convivencia, this living together, was natural, and indeed when we look back on it, we're so struck that in the Middle Ages you can have an intermingling of peoples of three religions, we're also aware that a decade or so later, civil war had broken out in Castile. And this civil war ravaged all of the communities. The particular focus of the attack of those who rebelled against King Pedro I was precisely his rule. These people who began the rebellion were partisans of his half-brother, Henry, Henry of Trastamara. And what we note is that Henry of Trastamara was able to gain much support from the population, both military and financial, because Henry severely criticized the pro-Jewish policies of his half-brother, King Pedro. It was in the late 1360s, in the late 1360s, that the Civil War came to an end. Henry had lured his half-brother, Pedro, to come to the fields of Montiel, and there in the great moment of Spanish history, Henry massacres Pedro's forces and kills Pedro himself. What we do note is that even after Henry comes to the throne, he who had owed much to his rise as now the King of Castile to his blatant anti-Jewish propaganda, King Henry II, we find has Jews in the highest positions of his government just as his brother Pedro did. So our sense of convivencia, our reveling in the interminglings of the th peoples of the three religions have to be tempered by a sense that there was latent anti-Judaism within Castile, noteworthy enough that King Henry could use it to catapult himself to power, and yet at the same time, the Jews were needed. The Jews were needed financially. They were needed managerially. Castile was mainly a two-class society of uh, upper nobility, lords, and poor peasantry. And there was a lack of a middle class, and the Jews precisely filled that role within that society. If we move from the kingdom of Castile eastward to the kingdom of Aragon, we find a different situation. While in the 13th century the Jews had risen to the heights of political power under King James I, by the time of the early 14th century, the early 1300s, Jews had been replaced in these high positions, especially in the royal treasury. The Kingdom of Aragon embarked on a grand conquest which not only included the Balearic Islands, but also stretched to Italy and even as far east as Athens in the early 15th century. It was precisely this kingdom of Aragon which was so commercially sophisticated that a Christian middle class began to emerge, and the Jews, while not marginalized, marginalized were simply pushed out of those positions, and they had lesser positions at court. In the Kingdom of Aragon, which as we noticed bordered the Mediterranean, suffered much in the mid-century because of the Black Death. Black Death, possibly the bubonic plague, spread throughout the Mediterranean, especially affecting population centers that were close to the shoreline, 
and therefore the centers in the kingdom of Aragon that were on the water, especially in Catalonia and Valencia, their populations decreased by almost a third. And the Jews in these areas suffered in the same degree. Not exactly so, because while the Jews died in the same numbers as did other Catalonians and as did other Valencians, in certain cases, Jews were also accused of causing the Black Death itself. And we have evidence of some Jews being killed in the crown of Aragon in the wake of 1348. So how do we look at this 14th century? Yes, if you took a long perspective, you would say the Jews are still doing quite well because we look around at other places in the world where Jews lived in the 14th century. And we note that in the Iberian Peninsula, economically and socially, they were doing quite well in comparison to these other communities. But also by looking at these, the dynamics of 14th century Jewish life in the peninsula squarely in the eye, we also note that there seems to be troubling brewing beneath the surface. Nothing, though, could have prepared the Jews for what takes place in the late spring and early summer of 1391. We have to now shift our attention to the Kingdom of Castile and precisely to the southern city of Seville. On June 4th, 1391, mobs from the surrounding countryside invaded the Jewish quarter of Seville and they were led by Ferrante Martinez, who was the archdeacon of Esija. What allowed Ferrante Martinez in this late spring day to be able to invade the Jewish quarter at will? Well, we need to back up a little bit. The king of Castile, John I, had died in 1390 and left an underage son as a monarch. And the archbishop of Seville had died in early 1391. The Archbishop of Seville and the leaders had protected the Jewish community and in fact protected the Jewish community from Ferrante Martinez himself. The Jewish community in the 1380s were aware of this preacher who spoke about the destruction of Jewish quarters, who railed against the Jews, who hoped for their conversion. And the Jewish community and the leaders and the officials, both royal and municipal, were successful in stopping him. But with the absence, with the vacuum of power, both on a royal level and also ecclesiastically, Ferranti Martinez and his mob were able to rampage through the Jewish quarter. Twenty-three synagogues Seville had, and they were almost all destroyed. Many Jews were killed. Some Jews forcibly converted to Christianity, but it didn't just stop in Seville. Clearly, the latent anti-Judaism that existed within the peninsula exploded. Riots break out, as I said, in Seville, and then north in Cordova, and then generally in the area that we call Andalusia and Chayen and Ubeda and Baeza and Carmona. The rioters went as far as Toledo, where in July the Jewish community was attacked and even the rioters went as far as Burgos. But the riots of 1391 did not simply stay within the Kingdom of Castile. We find them breaking out in the first week of July in Valencia on the Mediterranean coast and then in early August in the Balearic Islands in Mallorca and in Menorca and then, August the 5th, on a Sabbath day in the city of Barcelona, later in Girona, and riots continued even in the months of 1392 in the hinterlands of the Kingdom of Aragon. What an extraordinary attack. Jewish communities attempted to intervene with the monarchs and with whatever powers existed to attempt to stanch these attacks, but unsuccessfully. One of the great leaders of Jewry in the crown of Aragon was the philosopher Chastai Kreskes. 
Chastai Kreskis, who in his literary writings took issue with many of the philosophical formulations of Maimonides and tried to unhinge Judaism from its synthesis with Aristotelianism. But in 1391, what was on Kreskis's mind were not these philosophical questions, but the safety of his Jewish community. We have a letter that Chastai Kreskis wrote in October of 1391, a letter that he sent to the Jewish community of Avignon in southern France. And let me read from it. If I were to tell you here all the numerous sufferings we have endured, you would be dumbfounded at the thought of them. I will that, therefore set before you only in brief detail the table of our disaster set with poisonous plant and wormwood, giving you a bare recital of the facts so that you may satiate yourselves on the bitterness of our wormwood and drink from the wine of our grief. And Crescus goes on to describe the attack on the Jewish community of Seville, and then in Cordova, and then in Toledo, and then in Valencia, and then in Mallorca, and then he turns to Barcelona. On the following Shabbat, the Lord poured out his fury like fire, destroyed his sanctuary and profaned the crown of his teaching, namely the community of Barcelona, which was destroyed on that day. The number of murdered amounted to 250 souls. The rest fled into the castle where they were saved. The enemies plundered all the streets inhabited by the Jews and set fire to some of them. The authorities of the province, however, took no part in this. They offered food and drink to the Jews, punished the wrongdoers, and fought against the classes in the country who warred against the Jews in the castle. Many of the Jews were killed in the castle itself. And now Crescus continues. Among the many who sanctified the name of the Lord was my only son, who was a bridegroom and whom I have offered as a faultless lamb for sacrifice. I submit to God's justice and take comfort in the thought of his excellent portion and his delightful lot. Yes, we do know that Chastai Crescus, his son, was in the Castel Nou, in the new castle of Barcelona. You could still see the spot of it in the old quarter in Barcelona. And we also have records of Chastai Crescus's intervention with the king and the queen of the crown of Aragon, interventions which indicated how he attempted to save that Jewish community. He was not able to save his son. In the wake of 1391 and 1392 and the riots, what first strikes us are the many Jews who died. But what becomes crucial for the fate, the ultimate fate, if you will, of Sephardic Jews were those Jews who were forcibly converted. In all of the towns where there were riots, Jews were pushed to the baptismal font. But as the riots were over, and as the years continued in the end of the 14th and the early of the 15th century, we know of Jewish communities that dissolved simply because they could not, simply could not tolerate the financial burdens which they possessed. They could not remain Jewish in the face of unrelenting, unrelenting anger and pressure. And so we find Jews converting to Christianity not necessarily because there are people behind them pushing them towards the baptismal font, but seemingly, seemingly of their own volition, taking up the cross. Hundreds and hundreds of Jews begin to convert to Christianity. And this begins to incite among the Christians millennial fantasies. Christians had always imagined that in the fullness of time to quote Paul's words, taken from the Hebrew phrase, hayamim, those who had mocked and scorned the Son of God would return to him in grace. The Christian imagination about the end of days always was connected with the conversion of the Jews. And here, the most powerful, the most populous Jewish community that they knew of, and they were probably correct, the most populous Jewish community now seemed to be dissolving of their own weight. 
Jews flocking to the baptismal font, Jews becoming Christians, notions that maybe the second coming of Christ was at hand. The king of Aragon was also very much buoyed by this proposition and ecclesiastical leaders as well. Chief amongst them, Vicente Ferrer, the great Christian preacher of the late 14th and early 15th century. Vicente Ferrer was known as a grand orator. He would come into towns preaching about the end of days, the coming of the Antichrist, the great wars at the end of time. And often in the towns he visited in Castile and in Aragon, Jews were stampeded into the city square as people watched from the balconies as Vicente Ferrer would preach. And as Vicente Ferrer, usually preceded by a group of flagellants, would leave the cities, Jews were often stampeded to the baptismal font. There was a sense amongst many of the Christians that the victory over the Jews was at hand, a victory that would usher in the second coming of Christ. And so, the king of Aragon, Fernando I, together with Vicente Ferrer, and even Benedict XIII, the great Pope of Avignon. At that time, there was a schism in the papacy between Rome and Avignon. These three individuals decided to stage a grand disputation between Judaism and Christianity in the city of Tortosa. Now, if you remember, there had been a great disputation which Nachmanides had participated in in Barcelona in 1263. But here in the city of Tortosa in 1413, many representatives of the Jewish community were invited to take part in the debate. Oh, but this was a different atmosphere than that in the 13th century. The Jews were feeling beleaguered. They begged to be left alone. They said out loud that debates between Judaism and Christianity are really not going to produce anything positive. The Jewish disputants were also concerned about the families they left at home. They had heard from their families that they too were being pressured and pressured to convert. The disputation in Barcelona took approximately two weeks. The disputation in Tortosa lasted almost 21 months. 69 sessions, and when the Jews would retire for the evening, they were often set upon by many of the Christian preachers. Some of the disputants, even the leaders of the disputants, converted to Christianity. After 1414, and when the debate was over, the Jewish communities of the Iberian Peninsula were reeling. Vicente Ferrer wandered off to southern France. Benedict XIII was denounced by most of his Iberian supporters. And the King Ferdinand eventually dies in 1416. But the Jewish community would never truly recover. We imagine that maybe a third, a third of the Sephardic Jewish population, a third of the 200,000, were now officially Christian. What's going to happen with this Jewish community in the early 15th century? What will be their fate until the countdown of 1492? We'll see.